In this video, we're going to look at curve fitting in CAS XPS. And the use of the phrase curve fitting instead of peak fitting is very deliberate. And the reason I'm saying curve fitting is because not all spectra that are generated by XPS can be interpreted directly in terms of simple single bell-shaped curves that can be associated with chemical state. So the idea that we're dealing with curves that are representative of chemical state is far more realistic for many materials, in particular metal oxides. These spectra illustrate the point. If we consider this polymer, polyether ether ketone, then we have spectra that can be interpreted using peak models. We have bell-shaped curves. Each bell-shaped curve that we see here in the spectra correspond to chemical state that we see in this idealized peak polymer. So for example, we have two peaks here that represent oxygen bonded to carbon and oxygen double bonded to carbon. They are separated in terms of binding energy and we have an intensity that can be calculated from a bell-shaped curve for each one of these states and they are in the proportions that we might expect given our understanding of the material. So for example here we've got twice as many oxygen that are singly bonded to carbon as there are oxygen double bonded to carbon and we have a, a peak that is twice the size for the single bond compared to the double bond. So this all tallies with the idea of a peak model. However, when we consider metal oxides, the model breaks down gradually with the size of the atom. So for example, aluminium. Here's an example of a metal oxide. This is an oxide film on metal. So we see both oxide and metal signal. We can see there's a, a shift between the metal and the oxide, so that's fair enough. There's a chemical state shift. We have bell-shaped curves, at least we do in the case of the oxide. In the case of the metal, we see the doublet structure and yes, there are bell-shaped curves beneath the metal structure, so we're still within the regime of a peak model when we're looking at aluminium oxide. However, when we turn to cerium oxide, this is cerium oxide in a 4 plus state. The spectra from cerium oxide in cerium 3D spreads over a significant energy interval and it consists of multiple doublet peaks, not single doublet peaks that we see over here in the aluminium, but there are at least three that we can see by eye. So a large energy interval and multiple doublet peaks are all characteristic of these larger elements. And rather than attempting to interpret a material by fitting such data with bell-shaped curves and then saying that a bell-shaped curve represents the chemical state, this is not possible for the cerium oxide. When we turn to terbium oxide, this is an even larger atom, and in this case we have a fit that is purely based on curves. And these represent different oxidation states for the terbium. And when we add these together, we can create a shape that matches the experimental data. So we can fit curves to data and observe the amount of different oxidation states that are potentially part of the material based on complex curves rather than the use of individual bell-shaped curves to represent chemical state. So it's easy to see when we look at metal oxide data that curves can be very useful when understanding oxidation states for metal oxides. However, here is an example of a molecule that can be understood by both a peak model in terms of bell-shaped curves and also understood in terms of a set of curves that relate to this material. And the reason that curves become an essential part of understanding XPS data is that it's not necessarily the case that the idealized molecule is the one that we're actually measuring. So when we create a peak model for data such as these, it is clear that we have something that resembles sucrose. So when we think about the chemistry of sucrose, we count the number of carbon atoms in one chemical state, the number of carbon atoms in an, another chemical state, 
and then there's a third one in a, a different chemical state so we can introduce a set of bell-shaped curves that represent the sucrose however there are other curves that are involved that are not part of sucrose there's no evidence that sucrose should have a pure CH type bond and yet there's a peak that seems to appear at about the CH position in the energy spectrum so we might think that this is some kind of contamination we have some curves that could be satellite peaks associated with ring structures but nevertheless we have shapes that are in addition to what we might expect in terms of bell-shaped curves for sucrose and it's at this point that we might ask ourselves is there more going on in this material than simply sucrose and contamination? One explanation for the difference between the measured spectrum and the expected spectrum that we should get for sucrose is that the measurement process itself is having some influence on the spectra that we collect. And in fact, if we do multiple measurements of the carbon and the oxygen, which were what we measured to initially investigate sucrose, if we keep on measuring the sample using these two regions, and we did it 101 times, we end up with spectra that we see here where the carbon has started to evolve. We can see a shape that is increasing and various other shapes that are increasing that are associated with the measurement process itself. So rather than saying that we've measured sucrose, what we've measured is what XPS can measure from sucrose. And if we want to find out what these changes look like, one of the things that we can do is we can, from these data, construct a set of different spectra. And this involves identifying two spectra within this set here that are representative of the material initially and finally in this sequence. And then working out different spectra, we get a set of shapes. And from these shapes, we can identify, hopefully, shapes that make sense physically in terms of the sucrose which is what we see here this is an, very close to what we would expect for sucrose and then some product that is a result of the measurement process itself and if we introduce just bell-shaped curves into these two we can clearly see the structure of sucrose and we can also see that there's more going on than simply sucrose when we measure the spectrum in the first instance and this is possible if we then fit these data with these two shapes that we have here and we can see that the initial sucrose measurement did have some shape that was present in other spectra at different cycles in this measurement so after 25 cycles you can see it's grown to a certain extent and after 100 cycles there's quite a significant proportion of this additional degradation product that is arriving as a consequence of measurement by XPS and while this may seem like a problem, it's not such a problem if we understand what's happening. So when we measure the sucrose and we do a peak model based on the sucrose, we can see that the first measurement that we performed can be interpreted as sucrose plus something else. The analysis performed here demonstrates an important property of XPS, is that it's important to have enough data to understand a sample. So when presented with a single carbon one spectrum, it's really quite difficult to work out what is really going on. It may be enough to understand the sample from a single measurement. We demonstrated that it could be sucrose, but only after this extended measurement was it possible to get some kind of real handle on what was happening with that initial spectrum. And you can see from all of these data how this progression occurred and that it was indeed present in the initial measurement. So having data of sufficient quality and of sufficient quantity is an important part of doing XBS.